Tisha is feha a corja, good club lower bon uther on near her. A curry lower, egg lowerlin, fubble, fibly nagalive, le takiot o creative Ireland. You're all very welcome to our brand new book club, Accorda, uh, Women Writers of the West, which is presented by Galway Public Libraries and uh, with the support of Creative Ireland. Over the next six weeks, we will be exploring novels by three acclaimed women writers who are based in the west of Ireland. And in this particular book club, we're focusing on the Galway region within Connacht, uh, because Galway Public Libraries, of course, it's a, it's a good place to start. And we have three strong contrasting voices for you, writers with very different styles and approaches, I think, and they are Elaine Feeney, Mary Costello and Nuala O'Connor. Just want to give a little introduction first to say we're beginning with a contemporary novel set in a hospital ward that really speaks to the time we are in. Um, we have a novel about a very striking heroine who lives a quiet bookish life filled nonetheless with abundant beauty. And we have an exciting historical novel based on an actual figure from history, which memorably evokes the sights, sounds, streets and theatre halls of Victorian London. So the common ground, I suppose, is a focus on strong, strong female protagonists making their way uh, in the world and grappling with the various situations that they find themselves in. So I'm confident that we're going to be transported uh, away from some of the anxieties of these pandemic times into vibrant, vivid literary realms, and that we're going to have lots of fun tracing, you know, resonant themes, finding continuities and contrasts, and of course, sharing our thoughts with each other about these three accomplished books. Of course, it goes without saying that we have a large writing population in Galway uh, and throughout Sligo and Mayo, and it would be impossible to include everyone. In fact, I'd venture to say we have more writers per capita in, in Galway City, perhaps, than in most other European countries, but I don't know if anyone has uh, measured this. <laughs> but So I just want to pay tribute to all of our wonderful women writers and, and Western writers indeed. And hopefully we might be able to continue these conversations and give other writers a similar platforms and opportunities in future months. So this book club is following on from our two previously very successful book clubs. We, we had one in Eilish Dillon last October as part of her centenary. And then we had the journeys and words from Galway to Dublin, which discussed the short stories of Maeve Brennan and Liam O'Flaherty. So we're turning our attention back to the longer narrative now, to the novel, with these three novels, As You Were by Lane Feeney, Academy Street by Mary Costello and Becoming Belle by Nuala O'Connor. So as you can see, we're going to devote two weeks to each novel and to give you all plenty of time to, to, to finish the books. And, but each session will be different, so there'll be variety and we'll focus on different aspects of the book. For example, in the second week, we'll also have an opportunity to situate the novel uh, in the broader context of each writer's corpus. And so we'll get a chance to hear extracts from new work in progress uh, and to learn a bit more about each writer's inspiration, about their writing methods, their processes, and any, any tips that they can share with us. So we look more broadly in the second week. Uh, a special unique feature of this book club, of course, is the fact that the author will be joining us for each session. This won't happen, however, until after the general book club discussions take place. So the author interview will come towards the end of the hour, within the last 20 to, 20 to, 20 to 25 minutes or so. So to, just a few introductory remarks about our first book. As you were, it is Galway poet Elaine Feeney's debut novel and it was one of the most hotly anticipated books of 2020. Its main character, Sinead Hines, is a tough, driven, funny young property developer with a deadly secret that she's only confided to Google and to a magpie, uh, and certainly not to her husband and family or her fellow patients in the hospital ward where the book is set. So we're going to be speaking to Elaine later on, but let's go straight to our questions for our discussion first. So the first one is, what strikes you about the world that Feeney is creating in this novel? What did you find most interesting and or enjoyable about it? So the world, that she, it's a very unique microcosm that she's creating there. And what, what struck you about it or what do you find enjoyable? Secondly, there are some lovely rhythms and, <coughs> and Irish idioms in this book. Which phrases stayed with you or seemed you know, seemed especially familiar, phrases that you might have heard at home a lot. Um, and secondly there, had you heard about pishogs or pishrogs before? Do you know any other pishogs? So I certainly knew the magpie one, but I didn't know the ending of it. So I learned that from Elaine's book. I always used to say one for sorrow, two for joy, three, <laughs> but I didn't know how it ended. So, so that was good. And then thirdly, which characters appeal to you most so far and why? Okay, so I'll just give you a chance to take a note of those, of those questions, and when I stop sharing, I'll assign you into the breakout rooms. Hello, 
everyone, welcome back. I can see that the rooms are closing there and we're all coming back to the main room. So we'll just wait for everyone to, to join us. <clears throat> well, that was fascinating. I tried to get around to most of the rooms. I didn't get to everyone, but it was great to hear such lively discussions about the characters you like and about, you know, the, the main, I suppose, the main conundrum of Sinead, you know, at the heart of the novel and your reactions to that. And uh, so it was, it was really interesting to hear the different viewpoints. Um, well, we actually have our special guest with us. And uh, so because we've got seven rooms, I would normally ask for a little bit of feedback from each room, but because our time is a wee bit tight and um, I think we're going to go straight to, to the chat with Elaine now. So I'll just say a few words about our distinguished author uh, first, and then we'll, we'll invite Elaine to join us in. Uh, so Elaine is from Galway and lectures at NUI Galway. She's published three collections of poetry, including The Radio Was Gospel and Rise. She wrote the award-winning drama piece with Liz Roach Company, Wrong-Headed, which opened at the Dublin Fringe Festival and ran for the 2017 Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Feeney's short story, Sojourn, was included in The Art of the Glimpse, 100 short stories, edited by Sinead Gleeson. Uh, As You Were is her debut novel, and it was shortlisted for the Irish Novel of the Year at the Irish Book Awards and included in top debuts of 2020 in The Observer and shortlisted for the Kate O'Brien Award and chosen by Booker Prize winner Douglas Stewart as his best read of 2020. It has recently been shortlisted for the Rathbones Folio Prize, honouring the year's best work of English literature in any genre. Feeney featured in various best of 2020 lists, including The Telegraph, The Herald in Scotland, Irish Independent, Evening Standard, Guardian, Observer, Sunday Times, Foils and The Irish Times. Wow, what a list of accolades. You're very welcome, Elaine. Hello, everyone. Fáil <laughs> <laughs> Shishtok. Now, I want to establish your West of Ireland women writer credentials first and foremost. <laughs> so, okay. born in Galway, yeah. we know that. Uh, Rare to yeah. and Rye, am I correct? And teaching in Tume? Uh, correct. In Charlotte's in Tume. So yeah, you- so I was born, yeah. Yeah, born in Galway, lived in Athen Rye all my life. I'm very adventurous. Um, I actually live in the house I grew up in. <laughs> and I've been teaching in Tume for 20 years. So yeah, oh. I'm on a career break this You're year. You're definitely though, yeah. a bona fide woman of the, a woman of the West. Then. <laughs> and of course, I'm just thinking back to how I met you. We were doing a reading together in Sheridan Wine Bar all those years ago. And I think you had, you had won the National Slam at the time. And I was just blown away. You were doing two women car <laughs> walking do you remember that and I thought who is this wonderful poet I, I'm going to whisk her off for a coffee and uh, do you remember that poem you did with the, the poem I do <clears throat> that was called <laughs> Urban Myths Urban Myths yeah. in the Galway Girl and it was based around a, an aerobics class does anyone remember Curves I remember yeah, going yeah. to oh, yeah. Curves a, after I had my kids <laughs> and oh, Curves was, was less, brilliant. less about aerobics and more oh. about the, the chats. I love chats. So yeah, so that was it. Yeah. Oh, I loved it. Yeah. So Thank Elaine, you. to come on to your book now, um, you know, one of the most hotly anticipated books of, of, of the past year. Can you tell us how you came to write it? I know you were yeah. you spent a lot of time in hospital in, in 2014. Yeah. Is that where this that all was- came from? Yeah, that was definitely the catalyst I had. Um, I was very ill on two pregnancies. So I, I had a pulmonary embolism on my first and a brain clot on my second pregnancy. And I swore I'd never be sick again. So uh, I only had two kids. But actually, I ended up really ill out of pregnancy in 2014 um, and rushed to ICU and all the drama that that ensued. And I was 18 months in recovery. And um, I just I felt I had to write about a hospital space for, for various reasons. It wasn't actually just my own experience, but there was something about the institution of the hospital that I really just really, really wanted to write about. Um, and I was a poet, obviously, for years, but the eye in poetry wasn't going to work with the various characters that I've met over years uh, and maintained friendships with in the hospital setting. Um, so yeah, so that's where it came from actually, yeah. Yeah, and I just love the microcosm that you create so skillfully, Elaine. Uh, you know, at times it almost feels like cheers, except it's not a pub, it's a hospital ward. <laughs> You've got Michael with his trolley and and Molly with, you know, with all the gossip and uh, all the, the cast of characters. Um, 
you know, and then at other times it feels like a metaphor for a dysfunctional country, you know. Um, so it's 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 you can pan in or you can pan out, and and uh, you know, can you tell us a bit about how that came to you, that that world, and how you went about constructing it so vividly? Yeah, well, uh, well, I felt so. I, I was interested in in the idea of the institution and institutions in Ireland, and. Um, I was interested in a claustrophobic space. So obviously the novel um, is very panicked and can be quite hard at the start. It's like a barrage of bullets and lists. And um, anyone that's ever ended up in hospital will know the complications of the politics of a hospital. So, you know, you're going about your daily life and you're fine and you're a, you know, you, you do whatever job you do or, you know, whatever. And then you end up in hospital and suddenly you might be, you know, half naked on a trolley or without anybody or your phone. Um, and suddenly I realized that, you know, in that state of panic, how quickly your life in the world changes. And then when you're, you know, you're on a ward for any length of time at all, you, you actually hear so much of the stories of other people. They really do. I had the experience that they really shared with me. So I know that yeah. some people have said it, 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 it's sort of far-fetched, but actually it's not half as far-fetched as some of the experiences yeah. that I had in hospital. Yeah. Um, all the characters are completely fictional, but they're all hybrids of bits of me and bits okay. of people I've met along the way and so on. Um, that was my next question. And I was question. intrigued, yeah. I was About Sinead, how did Sinead, Sinead's character come to you? Was it kind of a piecemeal, you know, or did she just come to you fully fledged, that character? Was it so kind of a slow burner? Started, mm, no, she was, after I had started to um, rehabilitate myself, I, I started to pick up the pen, I suppose, to put, it, you know, a euphemism on it. And I, I was filled with an anger that's obviously very palpable and very obvious in Sinead. And I started to write, I actually wrote 13 chapters of a sort of an autofiction about female experience in Ireland and just this one young woman oh, who okay. is, is angry. And I had kept, I was very, very ill and I didn't realise I was. Mm. And I was also intrigued by how public sickness is so you get so ill you're in hospital and actually in ICU there was somebody that actually worked across the road from me their family mm. and they, the story broke <laughs> that Elaine oh. Feeney was was dying in about two hours apparently okay. <laughs> where I worked which was really really ups- well it upset me late laterally I didn't know at the time okay. um yeah zero privacy and I thought I am intrigued by secrets, actually, massively. Um, my family have kept secrets. Everybody's family have these secrets. And I, I actually often thought if I was ever sick again, I would be intrigued by could I keep that a secret and for my own protection, okay. for the autonomy of myself. Okay. So that's where sh- that idea came from. But I know it's a very hard and it's very conflicting in readers. I know that it's a... Yeah. No, it's a great question. It, it's, it's a great, uh, you know, proposition. Do you know, I, I know of older people who've kept terminal cancer to themselves, you know, to shield their families. But I don't know of, of many younger people. D- is, is Sinead completely fictional or did, did you actually know somebody who, who was, is it a what if question that you teased out in the novel or is it more, more personal? Well, it, it, it's very much a what if. I remember having lunch with my colleagues um, on a school class break and I said this after being, you know, I, I, had, I hadn't spoken much about illness and I think I, anyone that goes through it knows that we, we don't really hugely, we talk around, we skirt around things sometimes. And I remember saying to my colleagues, friends of mine, um, that I would keep it a secret if it happened again. And they were aghast and I thought... This is a madly interesting reaction. They were so angry at the morality of that. Okay. And I said, but if, if you have autonomy of your body and you come into the world on your own and you leave it alone, um, don't you have the right to that privacy? But I don't know the answer to that question. The novel is meant to tease it out. And I think Margaret Rose has a, a lot to say about that autonomy. She <laughs> like, does. You know, we love Margaret so, Rose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. um, Elaine, it's such a lovely oral book, you know, and your poetic skill comes across. Um, I suppose I'm wondering how much do you think your background as a poet informed your writing style in the, in the book? Well, actually, I think 
I don't know many oral poets. I'm very interested in auditory chambers. Weirdly, I think poets can be very introspective and very image, like image focused visual images. I love overhearing conversations that people have. <laughs> I'm a bit of a magpie. And I love when, you know, you hear people riff and and the hospital for me is one of the most colorful places you can be if you're even just sitting in the shop waiting for, you know, your appointment. People will strike up a conversation. So I love the orality of language and I love um, the idea that my writing comes from oral storytelling. I didn't grow up in a bookish house um, and I didn't. My grandparents were real natural storytellers. So one of my grannies was from Merview, very much influenced Margaret Rose. And then I had a rural granny, but they told stories and I loved to hear them tell and I loved the, the, the rhythms of speech. And yeah. you know, some people are actually you captured those offended by that. that. I love the mithered, yeah. that's a great word. And I had to see this in print before, you know, mithered. And uh, you know, Jesus, Mary, and Joe, I declare to God and, and Jesus Christ above in heaven. And you know, these, these are all phrases we'd all be familiar with and we'd, we'd, we'd hear, and you just captured them beautifully. Um, so I, I mean, we'll talk more uh, broadly about the book next week and when people have a chance to finish and everything. But I suppose at the heart of this book, you know, as you say, there's anger, there's a, a panoply of emotions. And, you know, yeah. many of us have been reading the report from the Commission on the Mother and Baby Homes published last month. Um, and, you know, you talked, I, thought, I think, very eloquently in The Guardian about the somatic pain that that women feel collectively in Ireland at, at the moment, just so many disappointments are being let down by the state, you know, over the decades. And um, do you think that there's a new openness now about telling stories and sharing secrets and, you know, seeking camaraderie and seeking support, you know, that, that maybe wasn't there before? It, it, it's such a complex question. Sorry, oh, this feedback of mine is it? It's such a complex question. I think w women have. Sorry, maybe someone's not really? me. It's coming out. Is it? Let's see. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If I could it's ask other people to mute, to mute their mics, maybe just to make sure we've no other feedback, that'd be great. Um, I think. The camaraderie of women has always been there for me. Um, but if I talk, like I'll talk locally and I'll talk about my personal experience of growing up and listening to my grandmother. And I wrote about her in The Guardian. She had 11 children. And to think that she'd belong in a novel to her would be absurd. You know, yes. literature with a capital L was for people over in the university and it was not books. Her story wasn't important. Um, and I find that really fascinating, but also profoundly sad. I think before repeal and around this time now at the moment, there's a, a there was a lot of sharing on the airwaves. You know, you you turn on Joe Duffy every day, and there's a lot of pain, and there's a lot of really painful stories being shared, and women have had to have a lot of skin in the game publicly. They've mm -hmm. had to share a lot of very intimate details again about their health, about their bodies, about you know what happened, synthesiotomies, terminations, so on. Really, really painful stories, and. I, I just, I wonder at what cost, you know, we went from secrets, 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 just telling maybe a mother or a sister or a friend or nobody at all, to suddenly then the last decade really sharing. And, you know, we're familiar with the oversharing. Um, and I, I, I just wonder to what, what effect this will have on, on the psyche and on, on, on even mental health of people, you know, that they kept secrets for so long and they're coming out now. And I know that because I work on the Two Moral History Project and yes. there's something profoundly moving and powerful in telling your story. And when I wrote As You Were, you know, from, from some of my own experiences and from experiences of women I loved, I felt I had to put it into a space where they were telling it to a secret confessor. So if it's the magpie, it's a secret. Or if it's Margaret Rose or Jane, who seems completely astray and then lucid at times yes. but she's telling yeah. her story to strangers and she even knows the difference she knows not to tell the Hegartys because they're you know they're in on something yeah. so I, I just yeah I just wanted to show that women tell kind of anonymous people these stories but that you know we have not we haven't reckoned with the shared somatic pain no I don't think I don't feel we have personally and and no. from what I'm hearing <clears throat> just about the commission's report reading part of the report what I've got through and reading the the stories and then working on the project and hearing the stories the orality they're very different they don't seem to match and I'm wondering 
who has a right to tell a story and, and who has the right to write the story. And it's all quite complicated. Um, yeah. But I find Is it there profound. there a cultural taciturnity there, maybe a legacy of colonialism as well, a reluctance to speak and this say nothing till you hear more, and then coupled with misogyny and patriarchy and all of those things. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 yeah, it's, there's a lot. It's, it's complex. Um, as no, you you're said. absolutely right. I think it's a post-colonial hangover that like, I think it's one one system swapped over for another to put it crudely and I mean it's far mm -hmm. more complicated than that I read a great um, article today about the Belfast poet Kieran Carson how he always profoundly was interested in the back room idea and that the internet has somehow taken away that that we share our stories in those small moments of a back room which this kind of feels a bit like but that yes. you know that there is that there is some sort of an intimacy that we can kind of be open and chat um, yeah. Yeah. you know and maybe that's what the Irish are really particularly good at and yes. that's what I think the ward space is meant to mirror. Yes and I mean you, you, you're you really articulating you know you're talking about areas that you know you're, you're giving voice to uncomfortable areas which is which is laudable you know and uh, even the issue of pain you have a lovely yeah. uh, you lovely in, on page 34 they warn you about the cold jelly more than any part of pregnancy or motherhood perhaps because we're awkward with truths or because we can put language on discomfort that's rather painless cold jelly sand in your socks but of course the words the pain uh, the sparser language becomes or oh, the worse the pain, the sparser the language becomes until eventually we pulverize it, uh, language, and we're only left with our pain. Um, you know, is part of this, I suppose, following on from what we're saying, is it kind of a universal paucity of expression around pain? Um, or are we especially good at, at glossing over the truth in Ireland, maybe where everything is grand? And, you know, is there is there a bit of a question? Yeah, yeah it's, it's following on, I, I think suppose, it's from what we're talking about, really, yeah. <clears throat> I think it's it's cultural. I I I think it it it's, it happens in many other areas. It's not a particularly yeah. Irish phenomenon. I don't think that we can't talk about yeah. pain. You know, um, yeah. stiff upper lip and all that sort of. But but when we talk about pain, uh, to talk to try to write a book to put language on these experiences, it's almost a first generation of that because we had these euphemisms or you know like you know you took the boat or you didn't have words for your anatomy or you don't have words for your body or you lost your baby um it, it's funny what we've done with with language and, and I actually I know I'm quite coarse I've always been that way as a writer because it interests me actually the directness of language mm -hmm. and how the messenger is often the person that's the wood person like you know the messenger is the person in trouble for speaking out truthfully about the experiences especially within institutions um so <laughs> you go into hospital and they ask that bizarre question and I apologize if there's any doctors on and they say what number your pain from one to ten and you're like oh, oh yes it's a test already, already in a test. Yeah, a numeric, you know, it, yeah. a, a numeric correlative for the awful pain of, yeah, how do you even begin yeah. to, it's yeah. a, I suppose it's the only shorthand we know in many ways. Um, so I'm going to ask you one more question, and then I, if I could, uh, with your permission, throw it open to the floor maybe and invite some of our Lovely. book club members to, to ask a question. So I, I suppose I want to end on a light note and just say there are many small comedic moments that bring levity into the darker existential parts of the book, and you do this so well. Um, uh, you know, is this kind of your your own? I mean, you're quite you're quite uh, you know uh, humorous yourself, I suppose, naturally. But it, or is this more of a coping mechanism for Sinead in this situation, or is it a bit of both? Is it your own kind of? Mm. She she's the least funny in my opinion. I actually yeah. can find her grating at times, even though I do <laughs> love her, and I know some people don't because they find her quite cruel but actually I feel if I look into her she's not she's only cruel to herself it's her own auditory chamber that's quite cruel um I found people very funny I found people in hospital very funny um a very close relative of mine is terminally ill at the moment and he actually brought this into the oncology ward <laughs> and, and and he took a picture today of him driving home and there was a hearse behind him and I said are you taking photos and driving you shouldn't be and he goes ah look at this this is too much and he's very humorous and you know he's quite young but he's been very very humorous and he's also very you know profound at other moments um I think it's a way of I think it's a coping mechanism and I think 
with the bigger the shadow of sadness, the bigger the sort of light of humor, weirdly. Yes, um, yeah, true. It's, it's you know, common humanity, yeah. I suppose. It's our way of dealing with, with uh, the dark. Irish people are yeah. very funny and kind yeah. of irreverent as well, in a way. And yeah. it's a wonderful way to be, I think. I just, yeah, yeah I met so many brilliant people yeah. in hospital that were very funny. One woman said to me, um, Oh, my husband is collecting me. She was having chemo for breast cancer. And she said, and, and, and he found a spot today on his back. And I had to have a good look. <laughs> and we had a good look. And, it was just, and she was in stitches and she was going yeah. over for Christmas. And yeah, so look, I just found, yeah. I just found the humor because I was in there for quite a long time. I just found it was just soul, soul food, really. Uplifting. And you captured yeah. it so well. And that's a gift in itself, Elaine. So well done Thank for that. You. You know. um, so I'm just thinking we might ask you to read a short passage. We've got about nine minutes left. So if people want to type up a little question in the chat, and I'll keep an eye on the chat while, while you read a little passage, perhaps. Does that sound Lovely. like a good plan? Yeah. I, okay. I'm just going to pick up where... Um, where the two student nurses, if anyone hasn't read it, it won't give away much, but Shane is in bother and the stu two student nurses have come in with a hangover to keep an eye on Shane. But Jane and Margaret Rose are trying to search for the glove of Padre Pio and see have they anyone that could connect them to it as a cure. Um, and again, we're very familiar with cures. My family are absolutely obsessed with them. <laughs> so I was given ointments and gloves and miraculous medals and so on. And, you know, there's always a plethora of cures. So it's, it's not meant to be... Um, irreverent but Jane woke Margaret Rose and they searched deep in their nightstands tugging out extra religious paraphernalia for a cure to save Shane. Margaret Rose was busy this was the best way to be after Nikita's exit. Jane was busy as this was her only way. The search for the cure went in a hierarchy of inanimate but precious objects with head nods and everything was displayed on the stripped shiny mattress of Jane's bed like an eccentric May altar. The two women hummed and hawed as they pawed over beads and cards and plastic statues of saints full up with water. If they could only get in the mitten of Padre Pio or a drop of blessed oil of St. Trace of Lisieux, or even a lock of St. Francis of Assisi's hair, even a hair from one of his pets, but they were unsure that Assisi had left behind any cure at all. But he was a lovely man. Yes, lovely man, loved animals. <laughs> Margaret Rose put Michaela on the Nokia to someone in Navin who had the mitten of Padre Pio. She'd been given it for her son who had developed itchy and incurable warts and it would be sent down on the next bus with a trusted bus driver <laughs> and hopefully make it on time for Shane. If not by this evening, with any luck, it would arrive by morning. Jane blessed herself backwards, which, according to Margaret Rose, was motioning in the devil. So Jane stared at her blankly, then began blessing Margaret Rose instead, misunderstanding the instructions. So we all blessed ourselves 10 times at Margaret Rose's request for fear we brought the work of the devil onto the ward. She encouraged a proper blessing. Michaela instructed that we do it like the soccer players. And she demonstrated to her mother and Jane and they copied her, blessed themselves, kissed their thumbs, then lifted their kissed hands to the ceiling, thumbs clutched and finally patting their hearts with the help of good God. And of all these many archangels, especially the favourite one, Michael, or so they thought, Although then they weren't sure as to which archangel was the favourite, the glove would get her safely off the Navin bus. Oh, thank you, Elaine. Wonderful. We love that. Yeah, the mitten. <laughs> and Michael the Archangel, and they're all in there on the Navin bus. <laughs> now, a question here for you, Elaine. Um, uh, wait till we see now. This question is not directly related to the book, but I'm interested in Elaine's, in Elaine's experience as an English teacher and what she thinks of young people's ability to write. That's from Marie. Oh, I think um, young people are brilliant, Marie. Um, I think that we, we sometimes knock the writing out of them. I think we have the beginning, middle and end. And I think we don't allow uh, character development and a bit of fun. And I think we make it all very academic very quickly. And I think we can destroy voice. Um, we can destroy their voice and their where they come from. So um, just very quickly, I often start off with a character, you know, and, and they always think of a character in their life or in their town or down their street. And sometimes they just start off by acting it out and talking in the character's voice and they laugh away and they think it's very funny that anyone that they know would make it into a book. And that's a bit like what I was trying to do with As You Are. Um, obviously, kids might not be reading as much as we'd like, but... You know, I don't think that the ability has gone anywhere. I think sometimes, you know, I can I can kill my own classroom very quickly um, and maybe, you know, a bit more fun. Um, I teach in university as well, and I have to say the standard is 
amazing. I told them after class today that I was retiring. <laughs> They're working. <laughs> But I think they just need to feel freer, maybe. I think sometimes with art, we we panic. We all panic a bit. And I think sometimes they just need to feel a little freer, especially at the beginning, and just let it go, flow, maybe. I don't know, does that answer the question? But, yeah. Marie, are you happy with that with that answer? <laughs> um, I love some lovely That's comments perfect. coming in. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, Marie. Thank you. Some lovely comments coming in. Wonderful book. Congratulations. You nailed oh, the you. authenticity and intensity of the cancer experience. One image has stayed with me, the queen on the chessboard. And that's oh. from Josephine. Thank you, that's Josephine. Lovely. Yeah, that was a much longer section, actually. And it, ca it came down to just that section of, yeah, the queen and the importance of the woman and the yo as well. I, it's a you, but I, we say yo and nothing right. And when I read it in London, I say yo as well. <laughs> My my agent is horrified, <laughs> but it's the female experience of the of the female sheep as well that I would have grown up with that. So yeah, okay. Bye. And there's a question here about the title, Elaine. How did you come up with the title? Your quote at the beginning of the novel is lovely. Why is it important to you? So I came up. Well, actually, the novel was originally called Sick, and um, nobody nobody agreed with it except me. I thought that was a great title because you know, but. Um, it actually, I will, I'll, I'll tell the truth. I was inspired by Liam Gallagher's tweets. I don't know if anyone follows Liam Gallagher from Oasis, but he, he comes from one of those problematic Irish families and he's not talking to his brother and it's quintessentially Irish. And at the end of all his tweets, it's when he goes mental. So Liam Gallagher will have a fit on Twitter and then he goes, as you are, LG kid. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I kind of do that with my book. I kind of just throw all of this at the poor readers. So thank you for putting up with me. And then it's just like, and that's it. So it's that kind of, you get this intensity, like a Liam Gallagher tweet. And then it's like, as you are. Oh, yeah. love it. Go back to love the, that. The button of life. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I think, yeah, there was a big Oasis fan back in the day. All right. Um, that's, that's brilliant. Um, Elaine, magical book. Love it, says Regina. That's so lovely. You, so I'm just thinking we might bring things to a conclusion for our first session today. Now we've got just got a few minutes to go until eight o'clock. We'll expand the conversation a bit next week to talk more about your continuing work, Elaine. You've got a new book in, in the pipeline as well. And maybe about the Two Moral History Project and other, you know, your writing process, all of those things, maybe moving from the short form of, of the poem to the longer narrative and what that feels like and, and you know, all of those those kind of things maybe next week. Um, so, yeah, just want to thank you sincerely for a wonderful first session and thank everyone who joined us this evening. And to say, Ihiwa, August set. Thanks so much, Elaine. Thanks so much, Elaine. Next week. Lovely thank to you. meet you all. Bye. Have a nice week. Thanks, Elaine. Bye. 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 Happy Shrove Tuesday, Bye. everyone. Happy pancakes, Happy flipping pancakes. <laughs> Bye. Fáilte is fíhe. Go club lár bán údar an iarhar, seacht in a dó, a cúrí láhar ag láirlín fáibli na gáilife le tacíocht o Creative of Ireland. Kehi Wilshev, our father, Korda, you're very welcome to the second week of our Women Writers of the West Book Club. And uh, over a six week period, we're exploring novels by three acclaimed writers based in the West here. And our focus is on the West, the Galway region of the West. And our three strong contrasting voices are Elaine Feeney, Mary Costello, and uh, Nuala O'Connor. So I'm just going to recap with you on our schedule. So as you can see, we're, we're devoting two weeks to each book to give everyone, so we're slowing down the, the, the lovely, enjoyable process of reading, one of life's great pleasures, and we're giving people a chance to finish the book, plenty of time. And each week, each week is different, so you know, no week is a, is a repeat of another week because we're going to take explore lots of broad themes. Week one, we'll kind of ease our way into each book, and in the second week then we'll go deeper and we'll also talk about each writer's uh, corpus of, of writing and maybe something a little bit about their process, their approach to writing, any writing tips they want to share with us and any work that's in progress that they can tell us about. Um, so the second week we, we kind of situate the novel in the broader context of each writer's overall body of work and we'll also get to hear extracts from, from new writing uh, that, that's in progress. So last week we eased our way into Elaine Feeney's novel, As You Were, 
a, a, a book that really speaks to the times we're in, I think, and which The Guardian called A Keen-Eyed Portrait of Modern Ireland. A Keen-Eyed Portrait of Modern Ireland. And we'll be talking to Elaine again this evening uh, as we delve deeper into the novel. And we'll ask her more broadly about her writing practice uh, and what it's like to move from being a poet to, to writing novels from the short form of, of the condensed form of poetry to the longer narrative. And next week we'll be embarking on Mary Costello's lovely novella, Academy Street. It was a um, book of the year, Irish book of the year in 2014. So hopefully there are many books available out there. You should be able to, to beg, borrow or steal. Well, maybe, maybe not steal, but certainly uh, borrow it or purchase it and get your hands on a copy. So do start reading this as soon as you can, because we'll be talking to Mary next week and we'll be easing our way into the book. And it's, it's a, a, quite a contrasting heroine to Sinead Hines. It's a, a quieter, more introverted, uh, bookish character uh, who has, a, I suppose, a life of quite revelation and beauty nonetheless. Um, so it's, it's, but there are some interesting uh, overlaps with, with some of the themes of Elaine's book, for example, being a single mother and things like that, and, and the life of, of the, the, the stigma that that can entail. Um, so yeah, and, and so I'd encourage you all to start reading that. And then in our final two weeks, we're going to be transported to Victorian London, where we will follow the exhilarating life of Isabel Bilton as she embarks upon her new career on the stage. And we'll get the sights and sounds and, of, of London in the Victorian era. Uh, so I suppose three quite different novels, but you can see three strong heroines grappling with the situation they find themselves in. And uh, yes, so interesting and nice, nice diversity of voices. And a unique special aspect of this book club is that the author joins us during each session, uh, but this happens after the general book group discussion. So it, it happens towards the end of the hour. Uh, so now I'm excited to mention that we have a distinguished member of our book club who has been modestly blending into the background. And she was with us last week and I wasn't aware uh, while I knew of her acting talent, especially from the wonderful Jack Taylor series, I hadn't realised that she is in fact the narrator of Elaine's book on Audible. So Siobhan O'Kelly, so how exciting, I, I'm, I'm a bit of an Audible addict myself, and what an amazing phenomenon, it's how many years has Audible been around, it's, it's only with us in the last two or three years, is it maybe five, yeah. Max? Yeah. And yeah. most of us are, I suppose, you know, subscribers at this stage. Um, so just to, I'd love to say a few words with, to you, Siobhan, before we go into the, the group. So I'm going to introduce Siobhan now. She's from Galway. She trained at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. Her theatre work includes Beauty Queen of Linan, Lipstick, A Fairy Tale of Iran, All My Sons of Mice and Men, Midsummer Night's Dream and Dancing at Lunasa. And wow, what a list of credentials, Siobhan. Her television work includes Casualty, EastEnders, Jack Taylor, of course, Call the Midwife, oh, I love Call the Midwife actually, uh, on Klondike, London Irish, Raw, Fair City, August Natligna. Her film credits include High Rise, Arath, which I believe is up for an Oscar, which is fantastic. Well, it didn't or get well, selected, no, it didn't get selected, but we well, had didn't get for, for weeks there. But to get to that, to get that kind of notoriety is, yeah. is, is fantastic in itself. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sophie at the Races, Treasure Island, Fractured, The Daisy Chain and Starfish are her other film credits. And in 2015, Siobhan won Best Actress at the European Independent Film Festival for her role in Sophie at the Races. And in 2016, she was nominated for an IFTA for her work on the TV series on Klondike. Siobhan, you're exceedingly welcome back to the book club. You've, you've, you've just read out my whole CV. <laughs> Nothing left. Your thumbnail sketch condensed into... <laughs> what about a few radio plays? <laughs> Siobhan, can I ask you how this all came about and, and what, mm. what is it like to narrate a book for Audible? Mm. Well, so it, really it's, it was simple in terms of like my voiceover agent um, put me up for it. And luckily Elaine and... The producers at Audible said yes to my voice, but I was hugely, um, I mean, I was shocked because I had never uh, narrated a book before. So I really thought, to be honest with you, I thought, what the hell are they doing choosing me? 
but it's interesting because it was Elaine's debut novel and it was my debut uh, voice book. narration oh that's yeah. so interesting and I was I was yeah. looking online today and you have a, a soothing assured was it the three the three descriptions were a soothing <laughs> uh, I thought that's so true. You do have lovely, mellifluous, relaxing kind of a sound. Soothing is the word. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm sure, though, I was chosen because of the Galway, Galway connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, lo I mean, I loved the book and um, I loved all the characters and I grew, I've i grown up imitating. Do you know, like how you all do at home, taking the, the mickey out of all the different accents and, yes. you know, I, I so I was delighted at the opportunity to just go for it really you know? go for it and did you so how do you prepare how does one prepare for this do you mark up passages that are dramatic yeah. and passages where you're going to slip into an accent or how do you it, it yeah you have to be intimately yeah. familiar with the book yeah you do there's a huge amount of work that goes into it actually because yeah. you only get about three days to read the whole book okay. about three and a half days I think we got and um and you don't really get somebody directing you like when you're doing a play you have somebody who's okay. always thinking about the bigger picture and thinking about character um okay. progression and all of that with yeah. audiobooks you're literally in a box in a booth mm -hmm. with a mic and wow. here and they just press go and you read and read and read and you just hope that you don't f up but yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I have to no fear of it Siobhan no fear of it <laughs> I mean, so you're self-directing yourself essentially yeah. doing yeah and you, you have three days to get it all done yeah and, it, and her book is 400 pages and they want you to do about 140 pages a day which is insane I mean you'd have to be you know superwoman to manage that but um I felt I didn't know Elaine Feeney at the time. I, I, I know her a little bit now over Twitter because we've become pals, but I didn't know her at all. And I felt very, um, you know, I did not want to get it wrong. I felt very, very. Um, you know, as you would kind of nervous about getting doing nervous. doing best for Elaine yeah. and doing best for Galway and yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Galway accents. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like if she was Scottish or something, I'd think, well, I'll, I'll never meet this woman. But her being yeah, from yeah. Rye, I thought, oh, my yeah. God, I can bump into her in a bar in Galway sometime if we're ever allowed to go to bars ever again. Yeah. <laughs> well, I had a little listen and you covered yourself in glory, Siobhan. And, and you know, so no worries there. Um, what was your... Which did you prefer, the, the really dramatic kind of thrilling momentum parts or the Galway accent parts with the Mithered and the Jesus, Mary and Joseph and the... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, you enjoy I, the most? Um, I, I loved just the different characters. I loved, yeah. um, you know, like Jane for me broke my heart. You know, I loved her story. And, uh, and yeah, I guess in a way it was a bit of a gift for an actor because there are so many different accents and characters. And just to go back to your previous question, because I don't think I answered it properly, you do you do get the script and you mark it up and you give each character a, a different uh, color so that you know, you know, when you get to black that that's the father. I, I gave him black because he was always given out and yeah. then Sinead would be red and then the mother was green because I felt she was a more calming influence and, you know, so you so that you don't that's get very clever. So that you can Yeah, so that you can keep yeah. an eye and yeah you know, so that you don't have to stop and remind yourself where you yeah. are and who's who and you've you know. seen this carry over then in your head yeah 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 but, but, oh that's fascinating but there were there were little things though that you know if if I was ever to if I was ever to work for an Irish writer again things like um you know you'd love to ask the author does Sinead Hines because you know her lists she's got loads and yeah. loads of lists and she talks about perfumes that she likes and they're French perfumes and you wonder does Sinead is she able to pronounce it in a flawless French accent or does she pronounce it in a thick Galway accent and you'd love to know you know how Blaine <laughs> hears that yes I was yeah, kind of yeah. sorry I didn't you know email her or try and contact her via Twitter and say you know how, how do you want this played you know but yeah. um but you you've got your own decisions. interpretation as a Galway woman to it as well, which is, you know, equally, equally valid as well. Just one yeah. final question. Do, do you think that some books translate, some books lend themselves better to being audiobooks, maybe more yeah. art, like acoustic books, such absolutely. as Elaine, for instance? Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I, think Elaine, I think Elaine has written a book. She's written a stage play and she's written a film, without a doubt. I think that you could do 
I think this would be beautiful to watch on screen or go to a play. I mean, you know, it would be quite simple in, in terms of making it into a play. You could have, yes. you know, several beds on stage and yes. I don't know, or a radio play. Like she has covered yes. all angles. I think, <laughs> yeah. I think as, as you were, we'll have a longer life. A longer life beyond, possibly, yeah. possibly on the stage. Yes. With yourself I, I, and the lead role. <laughs> oh, listen, I I've think, planted, yeah. I've I think this is a natural progression there. Yeah. 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 No, I, I totally, I agree with you because it is so beautifully contained. Um, yeah. Well, listen, that was well, fascinating. She, in terms of the way her layout on the page and in terms of her use of punctuation and yes. you know, all of that is very, I do think it's a book that's worth reading out loud as well. You know, when you're reading it to choose yeah. certain passages and just yeah. read it out loud and, and, and hear how that sounds because yeah. it is interesting. You know, that's the way she lovely observation. It is so oral. It translates mm. beautifully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for that, Siobhan. That was a lovely perspective to get. We really appreciate that. I'm going to share the three questions now. Nice, fun questions to stimulate conversation this week. What aspects did, of this novel did you most enjoy and what aspects did you least enjoy? Uh, do you think this novel is especially resonant at this time in our history? And why? Um, thinking about the Guardian, noting that it's a novel for our times, a keen-eyed portrait of, Ireland, of modern Ireland. Did this book broaden your thinking about the various themes of the story? And if so, how? And lastly, if you were making a movie of As You Were, who would you cast as the main characters? Sinead, for example, Sinead, Alex, Jane, Margaret Rose, etc. So who do you see in those roles? back with us again this evening for week two and um, as you know Elaine lectures at NUI Galway and published three collections including The Radio Was Gospel and Rise uh, and Where's Katie her first book. She wrote the award-winning drama Wrongheaded and Feeney's Sojourn is included in The Art of the Glimpse. Her novel As You Were which we're reading uh, was nominated for Irish Novel of the Year, Kate O'Brien Award, the Ratbones Folio Prize and featured in the best of 2020 lists including The Telegraph, Sunday Times, Guardian and Observer. You're very welcome back Elaine. Thanks so much Emily, <laughs> I was having IT breakdowns there. <laughs> <laughs> not at all, not at all, it's been one of those days we just gloss over and move along and uh... <laughs> how's everybody doing? It's lovely to see you all again. Yeah. The, oh, no. the compliments have been flying. I've been trying to flit around oh, to the various breakout rooms and we have a, a special guest, a nurse from Galway Hospital here, and she oh, laughed and laughed. She loved the, the comedic side of the book. Uh, oh, Helen, oh. are you there? <laughs> Hi, Helen. Oh, I see Siobhan O'Kelly. <laughs> and lots of compliments from about your uh, writing style and just your ear for a juror I know was complimenting. So lots of lovely things being said. So without further ado, I'm going to come on to a few more questions because we want to broaden out this week. We go a bit deeper into the novel and then we'll ask you a few questions, maybe about practical writing tips and things like that. So you gave us wonderful insights last week, uh, but we held back from talking about the final chapters. And you have a really beautiful cathartic ending, which I thought was very artfully done, very poetic, uh, you know, about cheering the you at the end. Um, quite a challenging, you know, thing to do to, 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 to round, to, to bring this to a conclusion. Was that quite, you know, was it challenging to, to, to end the story? You did it beautifully. It was the most challenging yeah. part of it, actually. Um, yeah. And of course, it, the thing is, you know, it's, it's such a novel about mortality. I'm facing that uh, as a young person. And you know, like like I said last week, I was so sick, but I came to the brink, but I'm OK now. And I had a lot of moral issues myself about writing it. Um, and I suppose for me, I went back into a time when I when I had been unconscious and um, it was because I had grown up on a farm and shearing. We call them yo's now, so I can't do the you thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but but shearing yo's, it was just so part of my life, holding animals. Um, and really just 
when I, when I was in labor, sorry, too much information, very quick in the Zoom, but when I was in labor with my second child, um, I started chanting like I was following the O's around and herding sheep. And I realized at times of great pain, I go into this mad space where I make these ridiculous noises that I will save you all from now. Um, and that it does something meditative to me. But it took an awful long time to write that ending. And I suppose I was trying to do maybe a Molly Bloom soliloquy at the end of Ulysses. I was trying to do Mike McCormick and I don't know, in the end it came off. <laughs> no, it's your own, it's a lady, <laughs> it's your own beautifully observed catharsis really with this animal relating to, and I mean, it's it's kind of suggestive of Sinead slipping out of consciousness or coming, you know, maybe morphing, going, it's, 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 it evokes so many things. And I, I suppose Elliot's objective correlative, you know, that idea of finding a metaphor for you know externalizing the pain that we feel and and you know uh i just thought it was it was very nuanced and beautifully done so well done it's elaine yeah it's really it's lovely interesting emily because some people one woman said at one of at a book club and i thought it was lovely but it wasn't my take on it but i realized obviously it's the reader's book and she said i just hope Sinead will be all right and i was like oh, oh. i'm not sure uh, <laughs> but, I, but i loved that she found it hopeful um yes you know, I had kind of left that little bit of ambiguity, which is just what we needed, you know, let the reader yeah. it off in their heads, basically. Yeah. That was basically um, yeah. And I suppose Sinead really grows by the end of this book. You know, she even says herself she's a bit judgmental and she comes to realizing how kind Shane is. She has new revelations about her, 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 her marriage and Alex and how kind he is and all the rest. Um, you know, so I suppose, you know, she's a complex character and, and you know, the likes of the Irish young adult author Louise O'Neill and others have been quite vocal about the cult of likability that, you know, the female protagonists are supposed to be so relatable and, you know, do you think we're overly accustomed to these overtly likable female characters and do we have the same expectations of male protagonists, do you think? Oh, it's such a good question. And I think you kind of answer it really. Uh, no, we don't have the same expectation of male protagonists, even as women, um, even myself <laughs> reading them or, or, you know, and it's so it's just so different. Um, you see, I actually really like Sinead. I'm one of the few people in the world that really likes her, I think. I, I, I don't see her as as complicated as other people do. And I'm wondering, is there something really wrong with the way I'm wired? Um, I remember my editor say, you know, talking to me about her and I was like, but she's wonderful. You know, I was so defensive of her. And then I realized, well, maybe she is really, I think people morally find the fact that she's had these affairs and extramarital um, affairs very difficult. And oh. I, yeah, that, that's a difficult moral question, I suppose, that's only answerable to the individual. She she brings up a lot of questions. Somebody said to me she's very, very cruel to her children, which I was interested in. Um, and at no point really, to, in my opinion, but it's always my opinion, in the novel, is she actually overtly cruel to her kids? A lot of what's going on, as I said last week, is in her head. And it's the yeah. thoughts that we all have that aren't supposed to come out of our mouth that, you know, that that's going on in Sinead's yeah. mind. You know, if that was a third person book, a third person narrator, we wouldn't know the interior life of Sinead Hines and maybe we'd be better off not knowing it. But um, I really wanted to write something about that fragmented, fractured, frantic, that's a lot of Fs, mm. space that, you know, as a woman I find myself in or I meet my friends, um, and they come out with these lists and this this frantic sort of you know they're, they're, they're everybody's very different and I just didn't feel that we were getting women characters that reflected this yeah she she's the topsy-turvy side of her role in the marriage as well like she's the breadwinner she's the yeah. developer um and I think it's because she's a woman that the question of her keeping her illness a secrecy is so difficult okay interesting no, that's 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 really interesting. Um, and it's lovely that you have such sympathy for her. And I mean, we can see how she's triggered by memories of her father and and, and all that trauma that she's had to deal with. And uh, no, I, I, there's there's a lot of, of uh, she is quite a sympathetic character in, in many ways. Absolutely. Um, so I suppose this leads me on to the next question. You know, I really liked the, the resounding feminist sensibility of this book, you know, mm -hmm. and I know you've spoken in The Guardian about the machine of misogyny in post-war Ireland and the repressed inward looking nature of society. And yeah, um, how, how far do you think we've progressed in Ireland, you know, in terms of, of violence against women, gender discrimination, you know, have we progressed much, <laughs> you know? Um, question, yeah. yeah, well, we have in the fact that we're not 
censored actually censored by a censorship board I suppose yeah. um, and and for me um, you know I could have written a very different novel and a much quieter novel sometimes I think I should uh, because sometimes when you go into this space of this feminist sensibility like you said it's very didactic and it can be it can come off as preachy and I, I really struggled with finding the balance. And when you ask about women, like you, we only have to listen to the radio in the last two and three months and the commission and all that's going on with the arguments that are constantly going back and over. Um, you know, the survivors seem to be saying one thing and then the machine of the media seems to be saying another thing. The hierarchy of the church is quiet, again, silent because they have other people that seem to do their work for them. Um, and I'm just confused and bothered still that the stories that I'm hearing from the women covens that I know and love aren't exactly the, the prescribed, or how would we put it, the actual stories that are being recorded. You know, the, the, the narrative seems to be at odds with the, each, each other. And I find that really difficult and really problematic, you know, mm -hmm. and it, again, it goes back to the unreliable narrator in Sinead and go, it goes back again to women being unreliable narrators of their own story. And that's deeply personal to me with regards to saying something, I'm going to tell you something, but I'm really sorry for telling you. And, uh, you know, you go to the doctor, I'm awful yeah. sorry that I'm here, that I'm sick. And, and it's all in our it's all in our narrative. It's all in our speak. It's all yeah. in our dialogue. Um, you know, I think everybody has. Yes, but we, we need to have autonomous control of our narrative, really. Isn't that isn't that true? Isn't that what you're saying, really, that it, it's who is controlling those narratives is, is the thing we have to unpack, I suppose. Um, yeah. And interesting that that is coming up in the testimonies a lot is that, you know, young women afraid of their fathers, you know, of the of the stigma of going home. And what will if daddy finds out that I just couldn't face telling my father? thought that was quite interesting, you know, and it comes up a little bit in our next novel, uh, Mary, Mary Costello's yeah. Academy Street as well next week, that theme is running through. Um, they reminded me of the time here, so I'm just going to move on swiftly. Um, there are a few questions just to ask you about your writing life. Uh, lots of questions uh, I'd love to ask you, really. Um, I suppose I'm going to ask each author in the book club, who are your own favourite writers and what books have influenced your writing through the years and, and perhaps made you want to be a writer? Oh, that's that's a big question. Um, I suppose in contemporary speak, definitely Lisa McInerney. They seem to all be from Galway. Mike McCormack, Claire Louise Bennett. Um, going back into my childhood, uh, all the fairy tales, um, stories, oral stories that have no authors, actually. They were just stories passed down. Um, they were a huge influence on my life. All the men in college, because I didn't realise we weren't studying the women. So, you know, Joyce and Shakespeare and Yeats and so on. And then, of course, Virginia Woolf was, has had a huge impact on this novel. But um, interesting. Yeah, so, yeah, so and poets, actually. A lot of poets. And weirdly, Roald Dahl, I don't know if anybody has read Kiss Kiss, the short stories by Roald Dahl for adults. There's one story in that called The Landlady, um, and it's really dark. It's They're really dark stories. Yeah, Patricia's nodding away. She's familiar with it. <laughs> Jane Lohan's voice came very much from The Landlady. So that was where I kind of, yeah, I, I grew her from that. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. And and Virginia Woolf, you said, had a big impact as well on this book. Is it, it uh, her, her her book on illness? I don't know if anyone's oh, familiar with that. That that definitely did. And I don't mean to criticize Virginia, but I was like, but you weren't that ill. <laughs> but it's a really good, it's one of the earlier books on, and you know, you, you see, that's the woman criticizing another female story going. We let you away. We let you away with that, Elaine. Don't worry. You've but got total immunity in this book club. Total immunity. <laughs> I just like the way she writes. I just like the way she, she doesn't have linear narrative, and it's all so. Oh yeah. I Amazing. like the fragments. Yeah, I, I love like that. <laughs> Mrs. Dalloway is still one of my favorite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, where does your poetry sit now, Elaine, in relation to the broader picture of your overall corpus? Now that you're writing another novel, can I, am I allowed to disclose that? Yeah. Uh, and how, whatever amount you want to reveal about it, it's perfectly fine. We'd love to hear a little bit about it. But, um, you know, having moved from, is, is it a very different skill set to, to, to go from the condensed, you know, short form to the longer sprawling narrative? Well, well, people always ask, you know, um, 
why did you move from, you know, the great canon of Irish poetry? Because they do like you in one genre. It's weird. <laughs> uh, and I, I give a very unartistic answer because when I had my kids, um, I could only write short little things because I, I didn't know. have time. I can relate to and, that. And that's the yeah. truth. And it's not always a very popular answer. But um, and weirdly, I, I didn't have the anxiety of influence around poetry. I felt hmm. I don't know why. And I should have. It should have been that way. I didn't have the anxiety of influence of the Irish poetic kind of scene. But with the novel, I was just, I was terrified of writing a novel. I just, okay. it just was, it was huge. It was huge to me. What are and the I biggest was, challenges of moving to that longer form? What do you think? Having to do an awful lot of work. <laughs> Keeping propelling the story going with the momentum. Yeah, and that's yeah, it. You, see, that, it does yeah, it, like, yeah. you know, you can, you can have a glass of wine and sit down and look out the window and decide, oh, I write a poem now you know it's a it's a different type of yes. thing but with the novel you just have to sit your bottom <laughs> on the chair every day after work because not I was working your bottom. full time yeah. <laughs> and not leave <laughs> and just <laughs> yeah and yeah. I found um the transitions very difficult so and Siobhan O'Kelly who has narrated this for Audible is here somewhere I saw her a minute ago but Siobhan yes. will, will know the, 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 this uh, this is very difficult in novels I set it on a hospital ward thinking if I if I shove them into some cave space, this will be easier. But actually, there's only so many times someone can get up and down of a commode or in and out of a bed. And yeah. that was, you know, I found that really hard. You can't make that poetic, you know. Yeah, yeah. and you do it beautifully. You've a great sensitivity to, you know, the lack of agency that patients feel, you know, whether it's ambulance trauma. I mean, it all comes in. If the book is teeming with with all of these sensitivities, I mean, you've, you're so alert to all of these these different aspects of that vulnerability that a patient feels. You know, so I I salute you on that. I just thought it was so well, so authentic. Um, and yeah. in, indeed, Helen, our, our nurse here with us this evening, she loved it and was telling us she was laughing. She she loved the the comic aspects of it as well. And uh, so we might I might uh, ask people if they want to send in a few messages on the chat there as well, a few a few questions. Um, but I have two more questions just to to round off uh, for this evening. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on now, uh, as much as you're willing to to impart? And what advice would you give budding novelists who want to devote some time, perhaps during lockdown, on writing their first book? Um, what approach would you recommend in terms of your own practical approach? Do you kind of plot out each chapter in advance or do you work from a simple premise and let it unfold itself? I, I hope I'm not repeating myself now. Sorry if I am from last week. But with As You Were, it was just a stream and it became huge yeah, very quickly yeah. and I end up having to get big boards and writing down each character and doing their backstory then and there were many many more characters um which was ridiculously ambitious for a first novel but it's a hospital and I realized how many people people meet in a hospital um so that one was really feeling my way just over the curve of the you know the hill sort of and it was day by day and I acted out the dialogue a lot the dialogue was great fun actually but it, it was it was quite painful and at times I found it really, really hard to continue with that. So that was, and I suppose the only thing I can say, and my second novel is completely different, so I'm going to talk about that in a second with the way I'm writing it. Great. But with regards to a book, it's probably how much do you want it? And I know that's really cliched, but how much do you want, you know, how much do you want to tell your story? And you, you don't have to have a full story at the start. You only have to have a burning desire to tell a story. Um, yeah. I felt very... I felt I had a, that lack of agency that many children have. You, you, you're, you're seen and not heard. And I suppose I had a burning desire to sort of say, well, now I'm going to tell you all about me, <laughs> you know, and that was probably started with the poetry and then it moved on into a fiction space. Mm -hmm. And I think many people have that burning desire to be heard in some ways that their story is valid and mm -hmm. everybody has a very valid story and everybody's story is unique. And the other thing I'll say is, what, what you're, you've experienced and, and where you've grown up and where you've lived, they are the unique parts of the story. We can only tell the same story over and over again, but it's when people do it differently with their experiences and everybody can do that. It's not rocket science. Yeah. Um, yeah. So some people would say it is, but it really isn't. No, you know? I kind of believe if you can talk, you can write, essentially. You know? <laughs> but it is, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah brain I always thought I wanted to write a novel, and I'm, I'm not kind of not as pushed it. I, I'm, I'm kind of propelled towards non-fiction, actually, and the essay, and, and I, whereas I always thought I'd be propelled towards fiction. So it's interesting 
where, as you say, what, what are your imperatives? What are you, where is that burning desire leading you to? I think that's a really good answer, Elaine, actually. Yeah, what, you know, and don't force it, you know, just, just go with what you really, what feels right and, and what, yeah, feels urgent for you. Now, there's a question here from Jer. Has the book been optioned yet for TV or film? What a no. question. Jer, are you a director <laughs> or a producer? <laughs> no, no, not yet. I know there's talks, but there's always talks, and you know, is the, is the quick answer. Uh, okay. And even for translation, because of the Hiberno English and the dialect, it's been very, very difficult for translators to get their head around it. But, but we knew that when I wrote it and I spoke at length with my agent about it and he really wanted me to stick to the originality of the text. Really? Because early on, early on, I was like, oh, I'll just fix it into, you know, Atlantic English. Is that a thing? I don't know. And yeah. he was like, no, it stays as it is. So okay. it's, it's a challenge, but hopefully it will be. But no, not yet. And you'd be open to all offers from from uh, <laughs> all. Uh, <laughs> I'm willing to talk to any of them. Elaine, on the subject of an agent, I know that Peter Strauss was was instrumental in, you know, the development of this book and, and just bring it to a publisher and everything. Would you recommend that people, when they have their manuscript written or almost written, that they approach agents? Is, is that a good way to go if you're trying to get into novel writing? Well, this this is another kind of funny story. So I had the poetry collections written and um, I had a novel, but I'd only told a few a handful of people. Alan McMonagall was one, actually. And Alan... Um, when we were at any literature event, he'd shove me in front of his agent and I'd run the other way. I hate that. I get awfully embarrassed. So I was like, stop, stop doing that. So anyway, somebody actually very kindly rang Peter Strauss, said they read my poetry mm. and that he should read it. And I remember, yeah, this story is sort of an, an, a ping now, part of the book. But he rang me one day when I was in having highlights done on my hair. And I was like, what is this number? And I had all these bleach tinfoil things in. And he goes, hello, Peter Strauss, I want imitate him and I thought it was a joke I thought somebody was joking and he goes um I've read your poetry and I represent Kashu Ishiguru and Anna in Rajan Column to wow. and I hear you have a novel and I said I do and he said what have you done with it and I said nothing it's just sitting there for a year and he said give it to me and that was the end of it so okay. highly recommend it because otherwise it was under the bed but that was a stroke of luck okay. really you know that so he would say an agent every time, and I agree. I just think just give it to them and move on. And and hey. they are scouting constantly for people, Aren't genuinely. They really? Really? You know, oh. yeah, they're looking for new manuscripts. They're interested in Irish writing, Irish voices. Um, oh. Yeah, so I thought it was fantastic, and it just worked for me. And yeah, I think people's it, it's just good. They handle all the stuff that I'm no good at. Yes, that's nice. Just hand it over to <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for, for that tip. That, that's wonderful, Elaine. Thanks for sharing that experience. Uh, just a final question about your new book. Can we ask you a little bit about? Yeah, so the new book is slightly on the cusp of dystopia, a, a dystopian book, and it's set of all places in a boys' Catholic secondary school. And it centers around one character, a protagonist called Jamie. And um, Jamie is under serious threat by different factions in the town um, and he's a great, great kid. So he, yeah, so there's this whole new scheme that the church have set up to return boys to masculinity and masculine order. Mm -hmm. And Jamie is one of the, the students that they've chosen for this scheme. So it plays out like that. But it's very much, um, again, a Galway novel. It's set in a fictional town this time because I have to, you know, make a little distance between my life and the novel. But again, an institution, again, a hierarchy. And again, you know, there's the Margaret Rose type characters and so on. It's full of characters in the town. Yeah. That's so fascinating because masculinity, of course, you know, it's 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 a perennial topic about how masculinity is affected by the patriarchy and hegemonic masculinity and toxic masculinity and you know exactly. how boys and men are affected by you know having to conform to you know not showing their emotions and, and all of these ramifications in society and so that's hot hot topic Elaine that sounds fascinating yeah, yeah. He's, a great, he's a great character I love him like already <laughs> well, wow. I've now, so yeah so Wonderful. hopefully soon so and you're, you're tipping away at this is it you, you're nearly nearly finished it Elaine or well, I've done what I think it's finished, but, you know, other people will tell you you have to rewrite it. So we'll see. I'm waiting for it to come back to me. Yeah. Fascinating. That's fascinating. Um, I'm just looking at the time here. So have we any more questions there? Um, there were some lovely comments in the chat in the various uh, breakout rooms there. 
So Elaine, it's been such a pleasure. It's really been a pleasure to have you with us. And, and Siobhan, thanks so much for that insight as well. Can and I folks, hear any of Siobhan's insights? Because we've never met, so. Oh, well, she had wonderful. <laughs> Is that okay? Well, we're, we're all kind of fascinated with Audible. And she was telling us about the process of having three days to, to record. And it was really, wait till I see if I can bring you up there, Siobhan. Um, there, yeah, I can see. Can you see? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was just such a lovely perspective to get really and it broadened out our whole thinking about the book as well and the aural aspects of it and everything so thanks so much to you both and thanks to all our readers and thanks for the lovely camaraderie and uh, it's just been a, a joy I suppose in this time of you know Covid anxiety and in fact my car broke down on the way here to Ormore Library this evening so <laughs> It's been lovely to relax and, and have a cup and chat with, with you all. And I look forward to seeing you next week. And uh, so happy reading of, of Academy Street. And uh, we'll see you again next week, same time, same place. Thanks very much. Ihua. Thanks, everybody. It's long. It's long.